So hello everyone, uh, hope you guys are doing well out there. My name is Nicola Antonietti, I'm a London-based sound engineer, mainly works on monitor. Uh, I've been working with uh, artists like Faith No More, Tom Jones, Jamiro Quay, Ben Howard, James Arthur, Jax Jones. Uh, it's been a hard time so far. Uh, I haven't seen a console actually since uh, my last gig was on March 14th. And we were doing uh, Brixton Academy with Jax Jones for his next tour. And it was the, it wouldn't be the second last week of the tour, but the rest got canceled. Since then, I haven't been doing much. I've been actually doing some gardening jobs to keep myself busy. <laughs> and now, thanks to Dave and Mark from Digico, they asked me to do this uh, sort of a demo for you guys. I'm really happy to do it, so it gives me a chance to touch a console again before, I don't know when would be the next time. So yes, I uh, hope you guys enjoy what I'm gonna show you. Uh, it's not, uh, I'm not gonna tell you what's the right way, wrong way to do. Everyone has his own workflow. This is how I like to do things and set up things. I hope you guys find this interesting and useful and enjoy. When we started uh, this tour, we had a really high channel count and a really uh, high output count. So uh, me and the front of our guy, Andy McGee, we both thought that the SD5 would be the best console for the availability of fader on surface simultaneously and uh, for the DSP processing uh, availability. The Total channel count was about uh, 88 inputs. Uh, I had myself run 100 and odd inputs, uh, including all the shot marks and the fair return. Uh, output wise, we were running uh, roughly 44 outputs between uh, stereo IMs, hardware IMs, uh, thumper channels, uh, stage returns, and stuff like that. Uh, we had, uh, so we had uh, one SD rack with 56 inputs and 40 outputs plus two AES cards and a mini rack with 32 inputs. Uh, along with that, I was using an NGB to record and send, do some reverb on my, um, just using like an MGB and to record and doing some reverbs on my laptop. Uh, I'm not a huge uh, plugin user, but I like using some reverb as once in a while to create some nice ambience, yes. Once I know all the inputs I have and all the outputs I need, the first thing I do is when I switch on the console or on the offline editor is go on the session structure. So in this page, I'm, uh, we can choose sample rate of the session, in this case it's 48. We can choose the number of inputs, the number of aux buses we need, mono, stereo, choosing the order you want them to show up on your uh, console and group buses, metric inputs, and all that jazz. Uh, what I tend to do is always to leave some spare channels, input channels, and output channels, just if something changes along the way. It's always better to have some uh, uh, spare channels to not be surprised, I mean, not to be caught not ready. Uh, once I get all my section structure on this page, the first thing I do is going on the I.O. page, or the I.O., to make sure that all the device connected to the console are seen and working properly. So uh, on my show file here, as I just said, we had a, a, an SD rack, a waste car, which is built in, and a mini rack, and then I had my two MIDI streams uh, connected to my NGB for multi-track and reverb. So once I've seen, once I'm sure that all the devices are connected and the console are, is seeing all the devices, conforming all the ports, I we're good to go and we start to we're good to go and we can start to uh, work on the setup and the layout of the console. So uh, let me close this. Cool. So uh, what I like to do, uh, there's two way of doing it. Of course, uh, I kind of like to go on a channel, tap in on the bottom and label the channel. Once I've labeled all my channel, I do the same with the patching. So I go on the top and patch all the channels uh, according to the input list. Another way of doing it, which is quite easy, is going on the layout page, channel list. And here we got all the input, aux, input channels, aux, aux outputs, group outputs. So once I've labeled everything, and patch everything, I'm good to go with the fader banks layout, which is the 
one of the most important things for me in terms of setting up my workflow in the most smooth way possible. Uh, what I like to do in this case is to have on the center bank all my masters, which are like aux sends, uh, VCAs, uh, control groups, um, matrix, mute groups, and effect sends. Generally, I use on the both on the side layers, uh, or the side fader bank, sorry, I use all the input channels. Uh, I try to have both inputs on both banks, so I'm easily, I can work my way around easily. Uh, what I tend to do on the left, right hand side, on the top uh, fader banks on the first layer, I tend to leave all the channels that I the most important for me during the show, in this case, would be all Ben Howard channels. Guitars, vocals, and all the little toys you used to play during the show. Uh, as you see, on the other side, I got a bank for the drum, quite of a standard, uh, uh, standard drum kit. Uh, good thing of Digigo is the multi-channels, which is really helpful. In case you have a, a high channel count on a drum kit, you're able to group some channels, in this case I've done the toms, on one multi-channel in order to fit all the drum kit in one bank, which is a really good feature. Uh, yes, in this case we had like two drum kits, one proper drum kit, one like more of like percussion kit, but it was still uh, laid out as a drum kit, uh, both with the SPDS, then on the third bank here, I got all the uh, bass and guitar and keyboard channel. Uh, I tend usually to keep them separate, but I didn't want to have uh, some inputs on a second layer. So I just prefer to go this way this time, which is work just fine. So we got, yes, a bass. So we got a bass player would play bass, uh, guitar would have an MPC as well. Then we had a guitar player, then we had another, we had a keyboard player who was also playing guitar, and we have a keyboard player who also plays violin. Uh, on the third bank here, I got all my backing vocals, all my, uh, we got a flute channel and string channels, and on the last bank, I had my reverb returns. So, doing this way for me is quite of a good way of having everything on one bank, so I don't have to switch between two banks, so I know exactly where stuff are, and if I need, I just quickly get there. So when I work with a solo artist with a backing band, I tend to uh, structure my workflow this way. So I use uh, uh, stereo axes for, to connect, stereo axes for the IMs mixes for the band members, or mono axes in this case for the thumper, or for the, the Ben Howard wedges, who has two wedges as backup. For the main guy, uh, I found this way of mixing, which is kind of, it's really, it works well for me, of course. It's not the right way of doing it, but up to you guys. So uh, what I do, I basically mix him out of a matrix. And uh, first thing I do, so I create a matrix, stereo matrix. Of course, uh, matrix are all mono. So we, what we have to do here is to gang the matrix. So what we do is we go on LCD function, gang, and select the two channels we want to gang. Important thing is that we go on option and check what are the gang uh, parameters. So in this case, I got everything. As you see on my trick out tubes, I got trim, delays, EQ, dynamics, insert, faders, and mutes. So once these two channels are ganged, I create, uh, in this case, I add, here we go, uh, four, uh, I call it stereo stem, but basically are four stereo axes. So uh, one stereo axis would be a mix of the band. The other stereo ox would be a BV mix. The next one would be a stereo guitar channel with his guitars. And the fourth one would be a, a stereo stem with his vocal and fair return. Uh, next step is going on the matrix mixer page and assign these four stems to the matrix. So uh, this way, I uh, find it easier to control the mix. And along with a bit of EQ and the use of multiband dynamics, I really find easy to find the 
the perfect place for the seats for the voice to sit in the mix. So it's a really good way for me to to mix it. And having all the band in pre fader and him on post fader, his mix is on post fader with a VCA. I can mix during the show. Basically, I spend all the time on VCAs, which is a really cool. It works well for me, and it's really it's really the easiest way for me. Since we can't really monitor a stereo matrix, I found a trick to get over this. So basically, uh, I created a stereo oxand and I labeled it as Benahauer mix. Uh, if we tap on the bottom, we have this function, it's called merge input. That means that we can assign, we can put a, as like a auxiliary input on the auxiliary, makes sense. Uh, in this case, I assigned, I go on here, internal matrix, Ben our left right matrix. So this aux basically has in inputs what I'm the output of the Ben Hauer matrix. Uh, next step is to go on solo, in the solo page, and uh, go on no solo mode. No solo mode allows you to have a direct input on your solo bars no matter what it's selected. So in this case, I have the Benauer mix matrix, uh, Benauer mix uh, aux. So no matter what I'm, even if I haven't anything pressed, everything is going to my solo boss is his mix, and I'm always able to listen to his mix without having to PFL anything. Once I've done all the setups for my console in outputs and labeling, I like to spend some time uh, focusing on the communication system. So and of course, my PFL. Uh, having all the band, uh, we got like uh, nine musicians plus five backline techs on stage, all with uh, wireless IMs. Uh, so everyone needs to be able to communicate with whoever they need. So uh, I start this process starting from my uh, my PFL and making sure I can hear everyone and everyone can hear me. So uh, the way of doing this, uh, like most of monitor engineer do, is we uh, we run our PFL out of a matrix. So uh, what we do is basically we go on the solo matrix inputs again, we select the solo we're using, in this case it's solo one left and solo one right, and we put it in input as in two channels of the uh, solo matrix. Then we have to assign these two channels to the matrix who's gonna go to the PFL. Along with that, uh, having uh, 13 uh, shout mics, uh, it would be a waste of input assigning every single shout mic to every single input of the matrix. So what I do, I you can either, I did a talk mics group. Basically, I, if I go on the page of my talk mics, all the talk mics are assigned to a mono group labeled as talk mics. Next step, I assign in the metric input the talk mic group. So, and assign it to my matrix. So, no matter what I'm listening to, in this way, I will have all the band and the text always able to talk to me, no matter what I'm listening to, which is a really cool thing. Uh, this thing created a bit, a bit of an issue for me because uh, often having Ben Mender talking really quietly or having backline text for all over UK with sometimes a very thick accent like mine, maybe. Uh, I was struggling to hear the virus request. So I found myself in need to uh, be able to duck the solo bus while the band members or techs were talking to me. Uh, again, being digital, a really flexible system, I managed to uh, find a solution for this, which is basically I just created uh, another, another matrix which is, uh, I just label it as matrix solo left and right, assigned to this matrix just the solo bus. Then I assign the output of this matrix to the input or to other mix matrix input channels. So on the matrix, in this case, it's matrix in 22, 20, 23, 24, I got this input, we go in matrix input, we go internal, matrix, matrix solo left, and matrix solo right. Now this one will, along with the talk group, will we'll, we'll talk my groups, will go straight to my PFL matrix. I go on the matrix master of the solo matrix, and I would enable uh, 
the docking system. Basically, uh, if we go here, we can select dock and key, we will give the talk mics group in order that when everyone will talk, it will trigger the dock and will dock the solo bus. Or in this case, I've done 15 dBs, and then you guys can do how much works for you, uh, along with the attack and a hold and a release time. Uh, this really helped me in being able to understand all the requests during show, during sound check. It's very important for me. Communication nowadays is the most important thing, so this makes everything so much easier. Snapshot. So uh, once I am all ready to go, so I got all my uh, top back set up, I got all my uh, inputs label and all that jazz, I like to have a look to my snapshot situation. So first thing I do, I create uh, two kind of snapshots. So I create a start snapshot, which will I start dialing stuff to everyone, just to make sure when, when the band are on, arrives to the rehearsal room or on stage, they all have something to listen to. And that's the, the uh, snapshot that I'm gonna mix on until we have a solid mix and then we can start duplicating it and label it for song name. Another thing I do is a snapshot call, I call it band only, but we can call it, we can call it solo, me, 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 or however you want. It's basically a snapshot where every, each, each band member has his own instrument. This is really helpful for uh, when during sound check, band shows out a bit earlier and the keyboard player maybe needs to go through his patches, while the guitar player needs to set his pedals. So everyone is just listening to their own instruments and there's no distraction within listening to everyone else. I find it really useful and it's a really good way of doing things. Uh, so yeah, once we got all our, once we've done all our rehearsals, we got all our snapshot, what I like to do is to group them and so create a group. You can like create more than one group. I like to create one group and group all of them in the same one. Uh, once I've done this, I, once you group all of them, all the name uh, appears written in blue, right? Uh, the thing I like to do now is to go on relative groups. And as soon as you press relative group, all the names now are now red. Uh, I like this because it gives me, it's, it gives me two options of uh, propagating a change during uh, the show, basically. Uh, let's say that uh, we start like, uh, starting sound check and the band like band members say, well, I need to, I want my guitar at this level for the old show. So what we're gonna do in this case is edit range, select all, make the change, confirm. And this way I propagated this level all across the board at this, at this let's say I put it at zero, it's gonna be at zero for all the snapshot. Well, the reality groups uh, give us the opportunity of adding those two dBs requested. Let's say the singer wants two more dBs on the kick drum, but the kick drum has different levels for each song. Let's say now I add two dBs on this song. We go out, let's say this one's starting at minus three. He has the kick drum at minus three, and I put it to, to minus one now. On this snapshot, it would be like this, but on the next snapshot, maybe the kick would be at zero, and propagating with uh, the relative groups, we will be a plus two. So it's all relative from the starting point of, of the starting level for that snapshot. A snapshot wise, another cool feature I find myself using a lot is the crossfade time. Uh, most of the time I find myself uh, struggling with this show because song would, would segue into another and maybe sometimes guitar player will leave the guitar feed, feeding back, but it would be starting from the end of the song and for the, the last song and starting until the start of the next one. So sometimes pressing next, it would make too much drastic changes. So thanks to this crossfade page, I'm able to, for each single channel, give a different crossfade time from the send and the fader, which is a really cool thing. So if you see now my well, I got not no many few changes here, but when I switch between a snapshot and another, let me get another, maybe another. You see the crossfade time is almost three seconds and it gives like 
it gives, uh, how would you say, it makes the transition between songs way smoother. And again, if you got, you can choose, you can choose every each songs, you, sorry, you can choose every each channel and you got different parameters so you can work on the filters, on the EQ, on the dynamics, on the sand. In this case, I use mainly on the faders, uh, the aux sands and on the faders. Before I start creating a snapshot, I just, it's always a good thing to go on global scope and see what is in the scope. The good thing of Digigo is just every time it stores everything. You just need to choose what to recall. So it's not a big deal if you find yourself that you at the middle of the at the middle of the uh, rehearsal you say, oh, now I need to add something. So you can easily add it, and it's it's going to be stored and it's going to be recalled. So this is a really good thing. I usually what I tend to leave out of the scopes, the input device, so the head amp. I just I just want to set the gain, and if I have to make some changes, I'd rather use the digital trim. So on input channels, input trim is selected. Uh, usually then I tend to set all the, all the recall scope for all the settings on the channel. Then that again is totally up to you. Everyone has a different way of doing it. And I tend to leave all the outputs, uh, matrix inputs, matrix outputs, everything off the scope because that thing is once it's set, it's set and doesn't need to be changed usually. So this is how I like to do. Uh, and again, once you, when you create your snapshot in the scope page and recall scope, you can go individual from any individual channel, you can choose what to do. So as you see here, I got for some channels, I got filters, I recall filters, some other, channels are just recalled EQ. It really depends. It's it's really good because it gives you a lot of flexibility and it makes you it makes your work way easier compared to other consoles. That's why I love this console. Uh, right. Another uh, snapshot related uh, function I really like. So we are humans, we all make mistakes. And sometimes you might be tired, you might be jet lagged, you might be sick. Anything can happen. Sometimes you might be on a sh you might be working on a show file. I think I always recommend to be sure that you the the snapshot you're using is the one is also selected because sometimes you can be on the snapshot but you can have another snapshot selected and in case you up, you press update current you are updating not the one is selected but the one not the one you're working on but the one who's selected. So. Can, like erasing all the settings of that snapshot. And happen, unfortunately, it happened to me a few times. Uh, a good way to uh, repair this mistake is the following one. So when I, this happens, and I know, for instance, here we got, I overwrote, uh, I've been overwriting the settings of snapshot 6 or snapshot 14. Okay, so in this case, what I used to do is delete the snapshot I just overwrite. Go on files, load session. Let's say uh, the night before. Well, a good way could be reloading the session, but maybe you're in the middle of a sound check. You already done changes for the previous snapshots. You don't want to lose all your changes. So let's say uh, pick up a show file from the night before. It was a good show. Yes, boom, pick it up. So we got in Paris now. So partial load, uh, add snapshot. So uh, it loads up all the current snapshot you had on this show file. So we said we deleted snapshot 14. So let's say, boom, we select snapshot 14, close, load, shut on save, you gotta save. You see, now we have snapshot 14 back in place now. So this is a really cool feature and it saves my ass a few times because I have to admit sometimes we all make mistakes and this has happened a few times. So no panic, there's always a way to go back and pick up the snapshot you deleted or you uh, over it by mistake. So console option is a really good way to uh, set up your console, uh, making sure that it uh, behaves the way you want, let me put it this way. Uh, there's many options again, everyone does different things. So I got a few ones that I like to set up in all the digital console I use. So, 
One is to display the snapshot on overview. Uh, I really like to have my snapshot list on an overview screen as a user set list. Along with that, uh, I always like to have on my screen, sorry if I go back to this, but I think the note page is a really cool feature of this console. So yeah, when I, uh, along storing stuff in every snapshot, I always make a note of what I'm doing. So someone come in to fill in for me, or I load this show file after a long time, I know what I'm doing for every snapshot. As you can see here, we have like, Every, each every snapshot has notes. So I think it's a really good way to have it. And I always have it open on my center screen with the, uh, yeah, there you go, like this. So even if everything is in a snapshot, I know what's gonna happen in this particular song. Uh, display snapshot on overview is always ticked as yes. Then uh, we got this global second function, which again, I find really comfortable with it because uh, if I have to set up some hard mutes or if I have to use some second function to adjust pans or auxers, I kind of like to have it on all the console so I don't have to go and select it for every bank. And really important thing if you do it, I suggest to auto cancel second function. So when you finish to do your changes, if you forget it, if you forget to take it out, is this auto cancel uh, options that helps you to. Again, you can set the time. I usually live in 10 seconds, but you can do up to 15 seconds. So it's really, it's really cool. Uh, on the fader bank, on the fader page, uh, fader assigned channel, I, I kind of, I, I like to have it, but not on show. So I usually turn it on when I'm on rehearsals or when I'm sound check, but uh, when I'm show file, I tend to keep it off because it's kind of distracting. So I, it's a, it's a really good feature, but yeah, I kind of like to be able to select with the solo so I know what I'm doing and I'm pretty sure what I've pressed. Uh, Fader touch control is a really, it's, yeah, it's a really cool option. It basically allows you to, so if we touch the faders with my hand, the faders, are responsive, but if I maybe accidentally hit it with my elbow or with something, they stay still. It's even a good thing, maybe it starts raining all of a sudden, and you don't have time to lock the console, you put the cover on and faders don't go all over the shop and everything, you find everything as you left it, which is a really good thing. Uh, control fader to aux sand is a really cool thing and I use it a lot, especially for the way I mix. Basically, uh, let's try to make it as simple as I can. Let's say that the uh, drummer wants uh, more of his drum, uh, rather than going and turn up every single channel, the master fader or the control group will trim all the channels to the selected mixes. So as we see, we can turn it up and down. That's a really useful feature. And uh, once we press, so when we go and send some fader, the, you will see that the master fader is a minus 10, and no matter how much you bring it up, the next time it will always come back at minus 10. So it's a really, it's really well thought. Uh, solo, uh, obviously I solo assign out the faders, so flips, when you press, uh, every time we press uh, aux master, it flips and goes to send some fader. Uh, uh, disable, sometimes I tend to, especially in uh, rehearsals, I tend to disable the uh, snapshot previous and next bottom on the console. Because sometimes on rehearsal we get all a bit lazy. <laughs> it happens and so I rather, just use the console, rather use the page, and just during show, I enable it back. So it's, for me, it works well, but yeah, again, everyone does his own things. <laughs> uh, meters. Uh, meter is a really, uh, so I've, I always started using SD default, which is a really, kind of good way of seeing your levels, and I really like it. 
but uh, so far I started enjoying using the Nordic one. It's, uh, I don't know why, it's just I feel it more uh, functional to my way I like to see in games. So again, it's a really personal thing. Console, so what I like to do is to load up start sub session every time, because as suggested by Digigo people, it's always good to, every time you turn uh, switch on your console, even if it, show, if it, if it uh, turns on with your current session, always good to load it. Uh, so sometimes I forgot about it, so a good way of doing it is start up with a blank session, so you're forced to do it. So yeah, this is a thing for me, help, it helps my, well, it helps me. <laughs> Uh, uh, another thing, of course, if when you're using waves, of course, we need to enable the waves. And yes, pretty much that's it. I tend to uh, display uh, s uh, display over alerts. I use it on during rehearsals, so I know which channels might give me problem. And so by the time I'm on show, I just take it out because sometimes it always pops up and annoys me sometimes. So yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, another thing I really rely on this console is the macro system, which is really a, a game changer and lifesaver. Uh, I always try to uh, group the macros and so I usually label my console. So I like to have a, for instance, this page is just uh, enables the talk to the band and uh, to every single member of the band or to a global talk to the band or just to the artist. So I can, I'm able to talk to each of the artists on, of the band members on stage separately. Uh, same thing with the backline text. I kind of like to, I kind of like to talk who I need to. I don't like to maybe talk with someone and maybe someone else is busy doing something and is get distracted. So I kind of like to be able to talk to every single backline tech and everyone I need. Uh, always being uh, communication a really important thing, especially with the band members, especially during rehearsals or sound check. I created a, a, a macros called show or sound check. Basically a sound check macro, uh, turns all the shout mics on to everyone. So basically all the band members can talk to the, all the band members and to their own backline tech and to me. And in show mode, basically all the band members can talk just to me and their backline tech. So they don't, and all the, the, the other band members don't get distraction and don't have to listen to requests. They turn this up, turn this down my guitar's not working and blah, blah, blah. Uh, yes, another cool one I have is the alt input. So I set the alt, always set the alt input on a macro. So if something goes wrong, I'm able to go on the spare straight away. Uh, so this one, I've tried to explain this one is a bit, uh, a cool thing we did on this tour, basically. We had uh, each backline tag as a controller is a self build by Andy McGee. I don't know if you know Andy, right? Yeah. So uh, basically, this, this we call them shout boxes. The shout boxes have a cut five, uh, shielded cut five input and a mic input, and three buttons. Each of every these th uh, four buttons, sorry, each of every these four buttons would send a MIDI message when pressed and released. Right. We connect the microphone into this box, and all the cut five goes to the, all the Ethernet cables go to a, like a a hub which separates the audio with the MIDI. So we connect the MIDI to the console and we're able to fire uh, macros via MIDI. So basically what we did, uh, we go on macros, we basically, so I find really annoying when, again, when a, maybe a backline tech needs to talk to another backline tech and there's nothing I need to know during the show. I kind of feel a bit annoyed because it's kind of distracting, especially because I, I got the ducking, so every time it gets my volume down. So with these boxes, we've been able to, uh, basically the first button will allow communication within the backline text. So when pressed and released with a fire macro, 
who would enable, enable or disable the communication within the backline text. The second button was uh, the backline tech to talk with me or front of us engineer. So again, when they were pressing the button, it will fire a macro who would open their microphone to our, uh, to my IMs and to the shouts box in front of ours. And the third one and the fourth one was for the backline tech to talk directly to us because every backline tech had two artists to look after. So basically the, last, the, the other two buttons were allowing the backline tech to talk to their own artists. And this was a really, really cool feature. And uh, it was really good that we managed, like it spent a little bit on programming it, but once it was up and running, it was like a set and forget thing has been working solidly for the old tour and it, it really has been a game changer. So again, macros is a really amazing future and I highly recommend the use of this one. Uh, a cool thing I discovered on this tour and I actually like to, it's not really a thing you can use every time, but it's really cool. So um, I've been using the dynamic EQ to get rid of all the spill of the drums in the vocal mic. So I, I wouldn't do it with the main artist, but I've done it with backing vocals and it worked just fine. So basically uh, what I've been doing in a setup, uh, enable the dynamic EQ, uh, select dynamic on, uh, and tell that when the signal is under the threshold to uh, get rid of 6 dB on this, for this, in this example, I've done uh, 4K with a quite of a wide uh, uh, bell. No, wide, wide Q, sorry. And this is really cool. So basically, every time this, when the backing vocal is not singing, those free, like that range of frequency is dimmed, and as soon as the sing, someone sings into the mic, it goes back as it was. And it's, I find it really useful. It takes a while to set it up, but once you find your balance, it's, it's really cool. Again, really highly recommend it. Pretty much that's it about my session. Uh, I think you guys find this, again, helpful and uh, found some new ways of doing things. Uh, thanks everyone at Digital for having me here, and I uh, hope you guys stay safe up there and see you around on the road sometime soon. Bye.